I am, uh, I'm going to full candor, extraordinarily nervous, but uh, I am going to do my best to take a hugely deep breath, as was suggested yesterday. Close my eyes, imagine you all nude, and release and scream inwardly. That's not true. I'm not going to do it. You all look amazing, by the way. I would like everyone to thank Mark, because without him, this would not be possible. You have done an incredible job, Mark. And if you Everyone thanks the DJ, no one thanks the organizer, and I feel you, my friends. But am I a millennial? So, apologize to any millennials in the audience. Don't, uh, don't write me off. Don't cancel my tune. Okay, so, yes, I called this side quest. It's uh, Satisfy Your Distracted Self. I am Hugh Elliott. Uh, you can find me anywhere at Hugh Q. Elliott. No one else would do anything like that to their name, but I figured it's the way I can do it everywhere. And I am uh, from Toronto, Canada, as Mark said. And I am an uh, artist, a technologist, um, tinkerer, maker, podcaster, huge nerd. So if anybody wants to talk Star Wars and wants to get in on the Mandalorian discussion, I'm totally down. I think of myself as always distracted. I'm going to be referring to my notes because I wrote this and I've been modifying it as I go. But I always have a new idea. So if I'm working on something uh, as a professional thing where I'm hired, something else will pop into my mind and I'm like, oh, that's a good idea. And then I'll turn and start doing it. And then my boss will call and say, hey, was that thing that you said that you're going to have done today? Was that done? I'm like, no, but look at this. And then the boss was saying, could you please get it done for tomorrow? And I said, probably. And I do my best, and I do. Most of the time, I do. Uh, but what I do is I um, I work on them, and I improve and enjoy it, as long as they have a way of flowing naturally from one step to the other. I really want to work on them. So for the sake of this session, I'm going to try not to get too distracted. And I'm going to focus on this one project specifically. But why did I call it a side quest? Now, anybody uh, play World of Warcraft by any chance? Um, because I got sucked into it a long time ago, and I managed to quit, thankfully, because it is a huge time suck, and 17 bucks a month are needed. But in gaming, a side quest is something that you can do that does not affect the main story. So you can choose to do it or not to, and it doesn't change how good the story of the game is. But if you do do it, it can be rewarding. It can add a little bit of experience. It can give you items that could help you along the way, but mostly not. It's just fun to do. And that's what I do on a regular basis for myself. I choose to do my side quests because they are things that have always helped me professionally. I use the phrase, um, my five to nine typically helps my nine to five. So if I learn something, when I'm doing something for myself, I can usually attribute that to something down the road. Or when I'm documenting it, which you've seen a lot of people uh, that have been on stage, they document their work, and someone sees it and goes, hmm, I want to get some of some of that. So then they hire that person. And so that's what's happened to me a number of times. And this particular side quest is an awesome example of that. So I think of myself as an artist who learned to code by accident. I didn't mean to. I got hired to do Flash. And when I got the, uh, this was 19, oh, I'm so old. 1999, I graduated college as an illustrator. I learned to paint and draw. That's how we do. And I got a job, I got a job interview, and the guy on the call said, uh, show us some flash work. And so I called one of my professors, and I said, or my old Linux professors, and I said, uh, I think he wants to see some cool, some flashy work. And he goes, uh, no, you moron. He means flash, which is software. And I was, I was really surprised by that. I did not know that existed. So I downloaded the demo and uh, Flash 3 and uh, stayed at a buddy's house overnight because I was living in Ottawa and I was getting interviewed in uh, Toronto. And uh, we had a bunch of pints and I showed up with a diskette as I did in 1999. He shut in the computer. He said, did you learn this last night? I said, yes, I did. 
And he goes, if anybody can learn Flash overnight, they deserve a job. So I got a job. And that was... <laughs> This is going to take a lot longer if you applaud. So, I spent the next 20 years doing Flash, getting a little bit better at Flash, every version, learning a little bit more, peppering that with my side quests, doing projects that interested me and then managed to get me a little bit of uh, notice and uh, let me stand on stages, uh, you know, invited to conferences, uh, be, be part of uh, this community, which is so fun. And that's years. And so, during that 20 years, as I'm trying to make art, and uh, I would release it and show people that they would go, oh, wow, you make art. Good for you. And like, what do you mean good for me? Like, that's what I do. My job is art. Oh, no, my job is yeah, right. I'm such an idiot. So, as we all know, that became a creative technologist. Now, creative technologist is a super broad term, and I would just say it's someone who uses uh, technology creative. So, as a creative technologist, and I was fully able to do this <laughs> as a technical director of front end team 30, I just stopped making websites. And I was like, I don't want to do that anymore. You can't make me. And I bought a 3D printer and I put it up in my office and I started tinkering with Arduinos and uh, LEDs and motors. And my boss would come in and say, So, how's that website? I'm like, Well, my team's working on it, I believe. And then, uh, and then I would have a call with each other, and then, and then I would give them a, a, a Yoda head, and then they would let me alone. And so, I, uh, oh, I was fired from that job. So I left that job and uh, started making stuff for myself. And the first thing I made for myself was a, um, a two-axis plotter with full core and motors. And that got me my very first job as a creative technologist. And I was like... I thought I was applying for a project manager, manager job. They said, do you have a thing you made? And I said, yes. And they said, we want to hire you, and we want to call you a creative technologist. I'm like, that's a cool title, dude. So that was my title from then on. It was super fun. So this circle is what I consider to be my focus. And I'm prone to hyper-focus on one thing and one thing only, much to the detriment of family, financial responsibilities, and, uh, you know, Cleanliness, normally. So it is what it is. But what happens is, is I start getting these requests. Uh, I started. Uh, I was asked to make a Star Lord 3D printed helmet commission for a, a guy. Uh, so I start working on that, and you can see out those. By the way, those are LED lenses, and you can see out those ones. It's not too bright, um, so it works really great at night. But it's, it's really neat to see through them. Or maybe I'm developing my own party glove. My party glove, of course, is a giant friggin' transducer that uh, gets kind of hot um, on the palm of your hand. But when you have plastic in between, it's just melted plastic. So, and then you have a, a Bluetooth module, and I can play music through windows and on desks and on walls. Uh, and I pitched this as, a, as an idea for. So, if anybody wants to make a party glove, I am down. You can take over a whole room with enough transducers, and it, it's, it's invisible. So you don't see it. Like, I just kind of go like this, and I interrupted an entire uh, conference call with my party glove. It was the best thing ever. I just blasted back in black from ACDC on the one side of the wall, and they're on the other side. Bang, and I'm like, the hell's good? So I don't care. It doesn't matter. So, uh, and then, as it turns out, sometimes I get calls and say, hey, could you build us an automation system for a fish farm? And I go, what is a fish farm? And they tell me, and it's like sensors, and all sorts of controls, so I get to model you know, scores, model stuff in CAD, design the system, use the ESP32, go up to the cloud, all that stuff. It's super fun. And then I find a 3D model of the moon where you shine the light through it and it looks cool. So I talked to a buddy, uh, a friend named Ben, he's on the Artemis mission with uh, NASA. And I showed him that and he goes, I want one. I went, Me too. So then I started working on that. It's a night light that auto phases with the faces of the moon. So if anybody wants one, let me know. Uh, they'll be on sale right after this talk. It's not true. I also uh, produced two podcasts uh, called Can't Sell This, which is all about creativity, and I interviewed uh, people like Mario and, uh, and Mark, actually. And I produced a podcast called Dismissed, in which I talk about job loss and how you move on from the job loss to health. Uh, and 
sometimes I build light bars with electrical tape and 3D printed stuff and uh, cord around. I should have pointed that out there once I can click it. And I can make the lights glow, which is super fun. Most of the time, I do great at this. I am really, really good at scheduling. I'm really done. So my, uh, my wife uh, is an artist and she's a formal project manager, so she has taught me how to make lists, which if uh, you don't make lists right now, get in on it. It's so good. You put a thing, you say this is important, you put a next thing, you say it's less important, oh, lists. I'm told it's called, uh, thank you. <laughs> Give my phone out. <laughs> that guy's applauding me, saying nice things about my wife. Um, but that's what it's called, prioritization. Now, it's a big word, but it matters. And sometimes I don't do really good at uh, juggling all those things, and I ask for help, and I say, what do I do? And my wife says, did you make a list? So in 2015, I started this side quest about long exposure photography in which I captured people doing certain things. And the first one was a Taekwondo black belt doing the movement. The second one was a Bollywood dancer. The third one is a... <laughs> This is a semi-drunk bartender going like this as he walks towards me. Because if you've ever tried to capture a bartender making a drink, that is super boring. So instead he did that, and I thought that was good. But what, and I, I, like the, I like the aesthetic of it. I really enjoyed how these things went together. Oh, ping pong, that's okay. I want to show these anyways. I love the aesthetic. But I had taped LEDs to tensor bandages, and all I had was this camera. But they look great. I was like, this is perfect. And I learned what I wanted to learn, and I called it LMC, Capturing the Motion of Light Through Long Exposure Photography. LMC, Light Motion Capture. So, every time someone asks me about a new project I'm working on, I have to make up a name because I need it to stand out, I need it to make sense, and I need it to... Yeah, well, it needs to make sense. I don't know what I was adding on there, but whatever. Because when someone says, hey, what's that thing you're working on? It's going to pop, right? So, like motion capture, I go, LMC. It's like, like motion capture. <laughs> capture motion like it belongs to me. So, fast forward to 2021. We're one year into a global pandemic. We're all freaking out. We're on Slack all the time. I'm super bummed out. I'm drinking a lot. And uh, my kids are going, what the hell? I'm locked in a room. On Slack, and I'm talking to one of my coworkers, and she says, "What am I going to do with this disposable camera?" And I said, "I don't know what you're talking about." She says, "Thinking Box, the agency we're working for, has decided their Pride Month campaign for 2021 was going to be um, uh, life for people in the LGBTQ plus community, and they were going to focus on their own lives, and then they were going to write a medium post, I assume." I say that because it's happened, and I know, so media post. And I said, well, as an ally, how would I do that? And I've been locked in a house that I want to get out of. So, oops. Yeah. So let's go back to this light bar. The light bar gave me a chance to use the original six guns from this 70s, late 70s pride flag. And because I have this whole thing with long exposure photography, I was able to... Uh, Make these bars, and so uh, uh, not well, it's like three seconds. Let me get Who's on the internet? Here's something I worked on <clears throat> yesterday and today. No, I have a little battery pack here. There's a trinket inside of here. There's a switch on the outside, and I have one meter of LEDs, 60 LEDs per meter. I'm gonna do some light painting, I think. And uh, this is the pride flag. There you go. So there we go. It's going to be awesome. Yeah, yeah. Um, I like my decisiveness. Oh, I'm going to do some light, baby. And then, uh, and then I talk a little bit more. So I, I wasn't keeping this a secret. This isn't a thing that I was, like, hoarding for myself. I was just sharing it on Instagram and then saying, like, hey, I'm going to uh, go out to my yard and I'm going to shoot some of this and see what happens. And here's where I start discovering that if I stand still, I'm in the shot, and uh, and I'm like, it's dusk, so maybe if it's darker, I can get a better shot, and holy shit, oh, uh, is there still children in here? Sorry. Holy shoot. Um, I, 
was really blown away by this, but the, the problem is, is that it's not part of the environment. This is just the flag being there. And I needed it to feel like it was part of the environment. So I went out to our local park with my son, who is 15 and really open to any stupid thing dad wants to do. And I said, let's go to the park. I've got this thing. And he says, hey, can I try something? And he takes a walk, waving the bar around, and makes this. And this isn't like, I didn't dial anything in. I just, I just said, okay, click, click. And I thought, how organic is this? It's creating something physical out of something ethereal. Light and beauty. It's a, a pride flag. Brown bird. We're getting there. I'm loving it. So, gracefully support suspended in the environment. <laughs> I just looked and saw that this is what I meant to say. Now, I am aware that this is the progress flag. I'm aware of this. And anybody that ever messages me and says, well, the progress flag, I'm like, yes, but I'm not animating, so I can't make chevrons. And black is off. So, I went with the six colors. Sorry about that. It still looks really nice. And so then I got into redesigning it because who's happy with the first version of anything I say? This light bar I've been using is a piece of cord around with uh, 60 LEDs per meter on a strip and a native fruit tree kit for your printed handle. Works okay. It's not the best. Here's version 3 of the light bar. I'm using these side mounted LEDs, new LEDs, and I've 3D printed um, some pieces that bracket the LEDs in place so they are held in place. It also helps to um, differentiate the colors. And it's a piece of uh, aluminum edging. It's fantastic. Big 3D printed handle, but a freaking thing. Alright, so I went out to the, uh, this is at the beach, and uh, I discovered that without my reading glasses, when I'm looking at my phone, I can't actually see anything in the dark, and I couldn't focus, so I didn't focus properly, but I was really pissed off, because this was such a nice feel to it, I was really enjoying the whole shoot, I shot about 100 shots, I put it in different positions, none of them are in focus, and that's the best one that I'm cool. So... That's when I learned the lesson to bring my glasses with me everywhere I go. I gave myself a splinter, by the way, so I'm a hero right now. And here's what, thank you. Here's what the interior, I, I keep looking back here, but there's a monitor right here showing me what I'm on, but I want to find. So here's what the interior looked like. Like it's a dog's breakfast, right? Like it's a power bus that I chopped a thing with a Dremel. I added a, a cord for a battery bank. There's the trinket. I'm just going to uh, hit this button because my phone's got a lot. There we go. That's what it is. All right. Oh, yeah. Shoot. I'm going to unplug that. FYI, hot electronics are not cool. It's being ironic. Anyways, I started to think about what I was doing. I'd done a couple of more environmental parts type stuff and testings. Oh, shit. I'm running out of time. Okay. And I decided to start redesigning. But I had a theme that I figured out what I was going to do. I've got three bars now. I started to reach out to, to uh, I'm going to try not to speed up because I don't want to do that. But I made three bars at this point. So I had my 60 LEDs on a meter. I had 90 LEDs on a meter. And I bought, uh, I made a half meter, 72 pixel uh, bar. And I went to a place called AAA Bar, which was, uh, that's not a place I know really well. And the owner was serving outside, so I was able to work inside, and I was able to just fill his lovely establishment with these beautiful ribbons. And people outside were like, what's that big fat guy doing? Is he supposed to be in there? But I was really digging how the light would reflect on surfaces, the light would reflect in the mirror, and the light would, you know, be on be everywhere. I just wanted to fill the space, and I wanted to get an understanding of how more, how much more I could move the move the bar. And then I went to there's not a theme to my shoots, by the way. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, my neighbor has opened a brewery called Red Tape, and you can see here. And this is an interesting thing about the bar. Mario went and I went on a little shoot a couple days ago. When you turn the uh, lights away from the camera, it no longer shows up. So. I was shooting the light.
lights onto the stainless steel drum or room, whatever it's going on. So a boiler, and then uh, and then rotating the bar back out, and again fills up the space. I just love that. Was able to start using the bar to light stationary objects, and then color around them, and then really, really exploring where I was, and just just love it. Now I mentioned the theme. The theme became, and this is actually still, this is a month of shooting. Uh, I called it uh, Pride Everywhere, Every Day. And that's why I decided I was going to run this project for a year. I was going to shoot in as many places as I could. I was going to be unapologetic about it. I was just going to get up in places and just set it up. And what I discovered, every time I went to shoot somewhere, someone would ask questions. What is that? What's that thing you're doing? Why are you moving like that? And then I would say, I did this. And then I would show them my phone, and they would see the photo, and go, holy, I was going to swear. Get in the room. Holy moly. And I would say, do you want to do it? And while they were taking the bar from me, we would talk about pride, and we would talk about what it's like to be an ally. And they would say, you know, I'm or whatever, my mom or my cousin. I really like what this is. I said, I really, I really like this too. So I was going on all these little shoots. I'm on a vacation. We were vacationing on an island. So there was us and like two other families. I was going into the woods. And I was really starting to explore the space. I'm not sure that's super high quality, but whatever. But I was getting better at uh, focusing, as you can see. But I was getting in the water, and I was able to like reflect in the water and really take up space and really enjoy being out there, and as I started to discover that if it starts getting dark in northern Ontario, that's it. I can't shoot anymore because there's nothing else to see but the ribbon. And although I really love the ribbon, it's just not enough. You know, it needs to be in space because we're right everywhere every day. And I was able to, you know, to have the camera be really far away from my subject. <laughs> I just noticed I'm in this. That's funny, right there, crouching. But there's the reflection. And I loved water, and I loved reflections, and I just was really enjoying the whole process. I like this one because it feels like it's a portal into just being an awesome ally. I was like, that's super gay! And I'm like so excited. Uh, this, this photo uh, is easily one of my favorites, and um, I was so pleased to have it be uh, included in the art uh, display at a local hospital. Um, a curator uh, contacted me and said, could you make it? 30 by 40 or something, and I was like, I don't know. Yes, and then I and then they paid me, and I sold it to them. They had a print. Uh, so if anyone wants a giant print, I can probably I can do it because this camera is not super high um, res. Oops, there we go. And then uh, the classic Muskoka chairs. And I got a call from a friend, and he said uh, he's living in Australia, and he said uh, this feels like it feels like home, and it feels lovely, and I love it. I want to put this up on my walls. So I'm like, can you sell me a print? And that's when I started thinking, like, I can't, uh, I can't make money off of this. This is not a thing that I'm allowed to make money from. So I, instead, oops, oops, sorry, I'm jumping ahead. So instead what I did was I said, if you donate 100 bucks to an LGBT-led organization, you can have a print, get a print somewhere in Australia, don't worry about shipping, and then uh, you can have it. So he did, and he sent me a receipt, and I sent it to, like, uh, like a client-related uh, organization, and I was just so stoked. I was like, I can make money to help people. This is, this is the best thing ever. So then, uh, coincidentally, I reached out to a friend of mine. Oh. <laughs> Don't make me cry. So I reached out to a friend of mine, and I said, hey, do you think you could give me some mini light bars? He's a guy named Wow Electron. His name is not Wow Electron. His name is Neil. But uh, his uh, Instagram handle is Wow Electron. He does, like, rain lighting and stuff like that. He does great wearables. So I said, could you make me some mini light bars? And he did, and they came, and I loved them, and I have these three printed helmets I made because I'm a huge dork. And I set up shop, I set up my little shoot, and I, I made these awesome little helmet shots. And uh, look at that Darth Vader. He's me, but so sassy. Now, let me talk. 
So, what I really loved about this is it's a rough helmet. I mean, by any standards of any cosplayer, I'm not a prop maker. Stop judging. But the reflections of the light bar in the eye, the, the, the way that the, the color moves on the paint, oh, I got so excited about it. And so that's when I thought, what else can I do? And the guy who ordered the print from me, or ordered, took the print from me, I thought, shoot, I could sell and donate. So I set up a Shopify shop, because it's super easy. I found a drop shipper, because it's super easy. And I figured out what it was, what they were going to charge me to uh, make a print. And I made the price 60 bucks more. And so I sold prints for $100, and I gave all of the 60 bucks to LGBT-led organizations. So over the course of the next three months, I donated to different organizations. Every month, I would just contact them. So, hey, I want to give you some money. And they'd be like, so, hey, yeah. Uh, it turns out people are really happy about getting money, and, you know, they're okay with donations. So I, I was able to donate, I think it was around $3,000 over the course of the next three months, like $1,000 every month. Uh, because uh, I, as an ally, it's not about centering myself, it's not about me uh, benefiting, it was about uh, centering the, the community. Stop. I'm running out of time and you're going to fuck it up. Oh, shit. Ch- <laughs> Apologize. So up until this point, I'm using, this is not me, this is just a product photo off of Adafruit. I was using these trinkets and... And you saw the wires, and it, it was really getting kind of clunky, and I didn't like it. And since I am a technologist, that uh, means that I could design my own um, PCBs based off these AT3085s. And AT3085 is a little uh, microcontroller. All I needed was a switch, send it power, and light up on an R- RGB LED strip. So I, uh, I did. I uh, designed a PCB that used the AT3085. And then I discovered I could animate the model. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm going to make this cool. Um, and then I ordered it, and I, I got a bunch, and uh, I swapped them all. I swapped all the uh, uh, controllers out. And uh, not to be outdone, I redesigned the handle so it also looked cool and felt like a lightsaber because nerd. So, uh, I mean, a switch assembly, everything goes together, heat set inserts, Prints pretty quickly, depending on how you feel about it, and the uh, aluminum extrusion just slides into the back and is filled in by some good hefty bolts. I'm trying to remember where I was. It's important to remember that there are assholes and there are people that are not going to support what you support. And if, even if you're doing the best thing with the best intentions, there's going to be someone using a slightly hidden homophobic sentence a comment that say enough with the rainbows. And when I replied, I'm not an airport. You don't need to announce your departure. Stop following me. And just like Dory, I'm going to just keep swimming. So I kept shooting. That guy took a double gun, and uh, I moved on. But remember to call your mother, because I was actually affected and bummed out by this guy. I was really not happy about it, and it was getting cold. Winter in Canada, despite what all, all the appearances, is not pleasant. So I didn't want to trudge out to a field in like two foot snow and drop a tripod and set it up and then go home. So I stopped doing it for a little bit. And then my mom, I called her, I said, I'm kind of bummed out. She goes, why don't you come uh, home? Come home. And she was 72-year-old mom, she sat there and waved the bar around, did her thing, explained that light needs to be seen, so she's doing what Mario did and sort of did this, and I'm like, you know what I'm seeing, right, mom, and I show her, and she figured it out, it was great, and then I started showing her what I was really liking, which is like reflections in water and getting farther away and getting really ethereal with it, wrapping around structures, and so, you know, that evening we're, we're sitting there. I got him a super hot chocolate because she doesn't drink, and I don't make her get alcohol for me. And we just talked about the whole project, and it was so nice. And my mom was the sweetest. But disaster. Sad Canada. That's called uh, jobless. I got fired. And no, 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 because I, <laughs> because I don't like the kids. No, because um, 
I got fired because of the fact that I disagreed on something that was fundamental to my job, and they also disagreed, and they said, you got it. So I was super bummed out, and I mean, like, instant depression for three days. And then I got an email that said, hey, I work for the WWE. I uh, love it. You can read it. I don't have to read it. Anyways, I don't know why I blanked out her name. That's a weird decision because her name's Melissa Martinez, and she's amazing, and she's my hero. So I blanked out her name, but I did blank out her email phone number because I don't want her calling up being called by email. So she sent me an email, and I went through that whole process of this is a scam, this is a scam, rolled over the thing, going, okay, it's on a bit late. Okay, that's the thing. And this was real. This was real. Three days after I got fired from my job, I got an email saying, could you come and shoot with us? Could you do stuff with us? And I was like, Heck yeah, I can. I love it. So, what was uh, what happened was super, super surreal. Uh, I, I'm not sure why this is blank, but this, uh, I think it's uh, work validated. They wanted to pay me, which is incredible as a newly unemployed human being. And I had spent the year doing this project, and I had trying to figure out. I was trying to figure out how I was going to end it, and I, I couldn't believe that I was going to be working with wrestlers. 12-year-old me was just so stoked. 49-year-old me was like, what? Wrestlers? But still, that opportunity was incredible. They flew me down to Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, I got to watch uh, wrestlers, uh, sorry, I called talent. I got to watch the talent get ready. I, I got to watch them rehearse. I got to watch the crew set up in a day. It was like watching a circus. And it was just the most incredible experience I've ever had. And there was an event so well organized. So we shot uh, one day in Providence, the entire day we shot, uh, we drove over a couple hours into Hartford, um, <laughs> and uh, I didn't know how to ship my bars, because I had a bunch of bars, and these like six different bars, so uh, you can't tell it from this angle, but this is a rifle case, uh, you know, and so I thought, what's going to definitely say not a gun? And I put the URL and the logo, and I figured that's going to solve that problem. And, and uh, the Americans, I told them about it, and they said, uh, you know, only Canadians care about guns. Like, Americans love guns. So you can bring it in, we won't care. And I'm like, that's a good point, Brad. His name actually is Brad, which is pretty funny. Um, so we set up, we tinted off an area, uh, we set up a giant strobe, we taped off the LED. Lights. This man at the bottom, he, he may or may not be able to make him out. This is me lying on the floor, by the way, as I prepare. Uh, that's Mike Marks, and he's one of the staff photographers. We actually, uh, they ended up hiring a woman from the, the LGBT community, uh, Eva, Eva Woolridge, and she's just a phenomenal, phenomenal photographer. Uh, and I guess, oh, this is Eva. She, she is, she's a powerhouse. She's a millennial, and that's a whole new thing for me to work with a millennial. I'll tell you what. And I'm like, okay, let's work ethic this and let's take a break, I guess, is what we're going to do right now. She was phenomenal. And so I apparently don't smile in photos uh, when I think I need to be serious, but that's me lighting up uh, on the bars. And what did we get? Because we're all very curious about this, so I still got time. I may actually just be speeding this up. This is good. I guess you haven't applied it in a while. But this is what I'm going <laughs> That's, that, that's called fishing. So I got, we got all these wrestlers coming in in either their day clothes or their uh, outfits. This is Sonia Deville, and she is an out lesbian within the community, and she was the, the main component for the project, and she was so stoked. We shot so many shots with her. Um, but then wrestlers would show up in their gear, and that was an intimidating thing, by the way, to be this next to that. And then I would stand there with the, with the bar, and they would walk up, and they would, there was a mark on the floor, and they would look at me, and i go, hey, got this bar. And then I would have to tell them what I'm going to do, because I would need to be like, I wish I had someone on stage with me, but I would need to reach around like this, and then go. But like also jump out of the way, so that the, so that the uh, light doesn't catch me. And this is, uh, just look at her. Oh, my God. That's crazy. And she was just huge. I'm like, I'm going to wrap you up good. 
She was super nice, Australian, super nice. This guy, I love this. He goes, what about this? I'm like, yes, you can do that. What about this? Yes, you can do that. What about this? Yes, you can do that. This is like a former Cirque du Soleil performer, and he's going, can I do a handstand? I'm like, can you do a handstand? He held that for three seconds. I'm like, well, I need more, because I was like, not just one second while I tell you what I'm going to do. He's like, it's okay. Seth Rollins, who's like the big WWE superstar right now, he's just, and it was funny because the photographer said, show us what it's like to be an ally to the community because Seth freaking Rollins is here. That's how I should. And I was like, yeah, buddy, come on. And they would come in their outfits. I'm like, this is so great. You guys are the best. Just wrapped up. Oh, it was so fantastic. So we, we shot a ton. I think we shot like a, a, 150 people over the course of the two days. It was just so much fun. And, and uh, I'm not sure what the next thing is. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So somebody said, do you never want to get a photo of yourself? And I was like, no, I'm in every photo. And then I said, can I have all those photos that you catch me at the end? Look at me looking serious. Every photo is me going like this and then jumping. So they hear like 220 pounds go. And then the, the rest of them, you know. So the first bunch were like they found out and that's what I was doing. And I was like, okay, now we know. So here's a little bit behind the scenes of the, the WWE did. Uh, I think we're nearly done, so this is good timing. Um, so this is a uh, and then and then. Oh my it's going God. on a Christmas card. Oh <laughs> my God! Today we are shooting 2022 WWE Pride Month photo shoot, which I'm super stoked about. I always try to get innovative ideas for Pride Month with the WWE photo team. We came up with the cool idea to use this like rainbow lightsaber that kind of goes across the camera lens and you get to pose in front of it. And it's super fun, it's super cool, and I think you guys are gonna love it. I have been described as dancing, and so I'm leaving the bar in a way that allows it to create a rhythm while I move. It looks a little weird, but every single time I've done a shot, once you see the result, it tends to go, oh my god, I can't believe that's what that guy did. Wow, you guys, you guys are so I know. I think it's really important to have LGBTQ allies within the company, because it's not just us fighting our fight. Uh, they're fighting it with us, and they can help and strengthen numbers, strengthen unity. Everybody is welcome, and so that's kind of what this photo shoot is all about. I'm very excited to be involved in this project as a queer woman of color, to be able to put my input and my gaze and to capture authenticity of the uh, talent that we have today. Who have been amazing. Everyone from every sector of this company jumped in and, and participated. We're all inclusive. We're all accepting. I was taking a break. I was doing it like it was 12 hours each day. And so whenever I had a moment, I would just either lie on the floor uh, uh, to, to stretch my back or to or I'd sit down and blankly stare out into the uh, half distance. And Seth Rollins walked past me and he goes, Hey, man, that light bar, that, no, he goes, that light thing's cool as fuck. <laughs> I was like, dude, <laughs> I'm putting that on my business card. <laughs> so, uh, um, I don't have a ton of advice. I'm not really good at advice, but I want to. I want to tell you something that came to me while I've, while I've been doing this over the course of the past few years. Ideas are not doing. Uh, even a badly made side quest is better than an excellently dreamed idea. I'm going to read these because because I, I think it's important. Quite early in my career in making, I got into the habit of executing quickly. You can iterate your work to make it better, but if you never start, you will regret. Next point. Make for you, not likes. <laughs> when you make for yourself, you will be more true to whatever vision you have. Don't allow yourself to be stopped by a decision. Sometimes moving forward requires learning. But if you don't learn, you don't grow. And of course, uh, ignore advice. If anything comes from somebody saying, you know what, make this better, do this. What? And then tune it out because they don't have your vision. It's no longer your project if they start giving you advice. 
or you can listen, and if that's good advice, you can take it. I don't know, whatever. But you have my permission to ignore any bad advice. People are, in general, amazing at having ideas after the idea has been had. So if you have an idea and you want to make it, make it. Don't let not knowing be the thing that stops you. It's really important we understand this as people, that the creative impulse is not something only for people who call themselves artists. You make art, you're an artist. Believe that, because I did, I guess, right? But wait, I have no idea what this was. <laughs> if you can see my notes, it says, insert text about this. What were the stats, right? Like, we all want to know how many sales did I make? Uh, how much did I get paid for the job? Um, how many likes? Um, I don't really know. I don't track it. I have no idea. I do know that every day a new like happens on one of the photos from Twitter. Uh, the people that I shot with that were part of the cat or the crew, every so often I get messages from them, and then they talk about how the photos they they so I don't, uh, I don't know. I don't do things for that side of things. That's for marketers, and marketers can care. I'm sure they do, and I'm sure somewhere there's some guy going, do you know what the ROI on that was? Pretty amazing. That guy was cheap. So what's next? Um, it turns out, like, just before I got on a plane, I got a call from uh, the Royal Ontario Museum, and they asked if I would be willing to work with them on their Pride Month uh, After Hours uh, event. Every time someone says, would you be willing to work with us? I'm like, what? Yes, I will. Yes, I, I, this is my job, I think. This is not a thing I do for work. So that's happening, I think, next part of June. And then, um, I feel bad. She have to write a bad word on that. Um, and then also a, a gallery curator just he, he messaged me and said, do you want to do a show in the summer? And I was like, is that a question? Like, do you ask people who do art, do you want to? I'm like, yes, I do. But uh, um, I think that would be it for me. We have two minutes left. So thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for your patience. Oh my God. I'm so, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I've been looking at this this whole time, and I'm like, what was this for, right? This is called a prop. No, no, no. Um, I just want to show you, this is all I did. You don't have to leave. This is all I did. There's a light bar. There's a battery bank, which I overheated at one point, but maybe I can plug it in. If Mark, if you don't care if I do that, I'm going to see you stand there. So we'll see if this lights up. Oh, right. I gaffer taped the switch. So that's the tripod. And you go like this, right? But you have a camera going, and then you let it go, and it's uh, not exploding. This is a cheap camera. This is a nice um, tripod. So if you're going to do long exposure photography, spend a couple hundred bucks and buy yourself a good tripod. I was using a $10 tripod for six months until my wife said, why don't you go out and buy yourself a good tripod? And I said, I love you, honey. And now I've got this really awesome tripod, and my wife's still amazing, and uh, Mark and his daughter. And thank you again. I'm so sorry. <laughs>